We're trying to uh, present the, the urban issues that are important uh, to all of us. We've worked, as, as some of you know, on issues that became important in the mayoral campaign, eviction, affordable housing. Um, and uh, and this, uh, what we're uh, doing tonight is very much about that and what we're, what we're doing ongoing with the What Makes a Great City. We have the Strong Towns effort that, uh, that Dennis uh, brought to us on October 29th. Chuck Marone will be back with Joe Minicazzi uh, and David Warm of, uh, of Mark uh, to talk about a study that the Hall Family Foundation uh, paid for uh, that is basically a study of land use in Kansas City and its relationship to urban development, its relationship to the tax structure, and, uh, and particularly to small-scale development, which we think has been abandoned in Kansas City uh, for over a generation, is beginning, partly because of what's going on in the library, uh, to make a comeback. And you'll hear a lot about that uh, from Kevin. Uh, in, in, a, in a minute. I do want to mention, uh, besides uh, the October 29th uh, event uh, with, uh, uh, with Chuck and, and, and Joe, that's a ways away, uh, but we have uh, some other, other things that I think you might be uh, interested in. Uh, on Thursday night, we have Gwen Grant. Uh, about every other year, uh, the Urban League presents a statistical review of the state of black Kansas City, uh, and we'll be doing that on Thursday night here at the Plaza uh, with, Gren, uh, with Gwen Grant uh, and, and the book that is essentially a statistical review uh, of what's gone on uh, in achievement gaps and in, in the racial gaps that we have of all kinds uh, will be available to everyone who comes. Uh, Wednesday night, tomorrow night, uh, also here at the Plaza, uh, we have David French, uh, and I particularly uh, am, uh, am interested in this. Uh, we haven't had a talk about this uh, in, in recent years, and it's about political correctness. It's about what's going on in college campuses and elsewhere, uh, and about freedom of speech, and, and, and it's an issue that's uh, dearly important to the library. And David has been taking a particular stance uh, in, in the world of conservative political philosophy that's caused uh, some controversy, uh, and is so, sort of central to the definition of uh, what conservatism, libertarianism, uh, uh, means uh, going forward in our current environment. Um, and then two more things I want to mention. Uh, Guadalupe Center is, uh, is celebrating its 100th anniversary, uh, and uh, I'll be having a conversation uh, with Chris Medina uh, at the Central Library on October 2nd, Wednesday, October 2nd, uh, about the history of the Hispanic community, about the importance of the Guadalupe Center, uh, about where we are with immigration uh, and other important uh, topics, and that we have a great exhibit of the history of Guadalupe Center and essentially a history of the Hispanic community uh, downtown on the, on the fifth floor. So. I would urge you to see that. Uh, and last but not least, because he's one of my favorites, so I want to I want to I want to uh, push him to your uh, attention. We have the fifth uh, appearance uh, in the Kansas City Public Library of the world's greatest film critic, David Thompson, coming from San Francisco. About uh, it's called Screening Desire. It's actually uh, about his latest book, which is uh, about basically about sex in the movies. It's called Sleeping with Strangers. Um, and it should be intriguing uh, and, and, uh, and fascinating and witty, as David always is. But to get back to Kevin Klinkenberg and why we're here tonight, um, he's, he has written about and, and been an advocate for uh, what I hope we're all in favor of, which is the walkable city. Uh, he's, uh, he, he's written the book, which you are obliged, uh, before you leave the building, to buy uh, out in the, in the hall, uh, Why I Walk, Taking a Step in the Right Direction. Um, he uses uh, the word sociable, sociable spaces, which I think is a, uh, a great term uh, about uh, the kind of development we should be looking for. We should be looking for development where people are happy to be seeing and be seen, to be with other people in an interactive uh, street corner uh, uh, life uh, of the city. Um, and that's what a lot of we're, we're proposing to the city through this, uh, this series is uh, development at small scale on street corners, uh, uh, building capital for, for local small scale developers, uh, getting back to the, the, the duplex and the fourplex uh, that, that much of our city infrastructure uh, is all about uh, and, and in, in a situation where there is, uh, there is commercial development uh, as well. And uh, we, we've had a city that's invested itself a lot in big projects. It's time to go small, I think, uh, and, and to look at the street corner. 
And Kevin is the right guy to talk about this. He's an architect, a planner, a developer, and a musician. Um, he may have played on a few street corners with his hat out, I don't know. Um, uh, he was the executive director uh, of the Savannah Development Authority and wrote their master plan for their downtown in Savannah. Um, he uh, has been a principal and founder of K2 Urban Design, co-founded 180 Urban Design and Architecture. He's a past president of the Kansas City AIA. He blogs at Messy City, uh, and uh, uh, he's the real deal. So, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Klinkenberg. Thank you, thank you. Thank you uh, to the library and to Crosby, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming out tonight. Special thanks to Dennis with Gould Evans for arranging this, spirit, this uh, series. Um, you're going to have a lot of speakers in this series, some really phenomenal speakers who uh, talk a lot about the finances of city and the numbers of cities and the infrastructure. And they're all, actually, you know, you may have seen some of the people who are coming back. They're all phenomenal speakers, and, and they're incredibly important and interesting topics to hear about. We're going to talk about something a little different tonight related to cities. I think it's really important to talk about context. I'm one of those people who thinks that understanding the context of what is going on and the big picture is critical for any conversation about uh, a, a complicated issue. And our cities and change and development and planning in our cities is a very complicated issue. And so I aim tonight to try to provide a little context to this conversation and really focus on the human side of life in cities. Because so I think we don't talk enough about the human side and the culture aspect of life in cities. And I started by choosing the most flattering picture that I could find. Um, so, in order to do that, uh, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about food. Uh, so, I hope everybody's ready to to get hungry. Um, so, I, I like talking about food for one, but I think it also provides an interesting analogy for the change that's taking place in our cities. You may remember it wasn't all that long ago when uh, we decided to kind of radically change how we uh, ate and made our food. And we had a period in time where the idea of sort of taking the food out of the freezer and popping it in the oven was the, the modern way to live, right? Everybody remember TV dinners? You had your turkey variety, you had your Mexican dinners, you had your Chinese version. Um, but we basically decided after World War II uh, to try to reinvent, in many ways, how we eat. And we adopted a very mass-produced, very generic, and a certain flavorless approach to the way that we grow our food and the way that we eat our food. Um, and we did this because we wanted to be modern. We wanted to adopt the, some new ways and new thinking about, about food. Well, nowadays, um, it's taken for granted that fresh, real food not only is better for you, but that it tastes better, it's more pleasurable. This has become a growing amount of common wisdom again. And it really happened in, in large part because of, of two women in particular that pushed back against that food culture and the change that was taking place uh, in the post-World War II years. And I know there were a lot of other people involved, but I think there were two real icons that made a huge difference in our thinking about food. Alice Waters, who essentially pioneered the organic food movement and has been a huge advocate for fresh and healthy food. And Julia Child, who really felt that food should be enjoyed. And I love this quote here where she said, food, we should enjoy food and have fun. It is one of the simplest and nicest pleasures in life and what an impact they had, and what a change there has been. The growth in farmers markets over the last 30 years is phenomenal. The way that we think about not just what we eat, but what we drink, what we put in our bodies, there's been a revolution in the idea that the fresher it is, the more local it is, the better it is, and the more pleasurable it is. That's affected things like beer, the spirits, and wine, which has also had a dramatic uptick in production in our country. This is the famous wine country I'm sure you all have heard of in Michigan. <laughs> it's actually, the wines are quite good. 
Um, it's even impacted fast food. And so it's come to the point now where you actually see advertisements for fast food franchises that talk about you know, how so much of their food is fresh, and you'll, sh you'll see commercials where uh, they'll show you the farms where the food is supposedly grown, right? So it's been a real sea change in how we're thinking. And in many ways, what you can think about when it comes to food is that in the 20th century, it was really about uh, we adopted a sort of a mass-produced and generic and flavorless approach to eating and food because we wanted to be modern and we had the money and the wealth to try some new and kind of dumb things, right? It's, not, it's important to remember that in those years after World War II that we were an extraordinarily wealthy country. We had effectively no competitors in the world on the industrial stage because all of the other major countries were devastated by World War II. So for a generation, we had an inordinate amount of wealth. So there's also been this explosion uh, that's indicative of this trend of TV and um, movies that talk a lot about food. Um, I really like this one. Here's a little clip from a new show on Netflix. So uh, actually, the show is called Street Food, and uh, it's really quite good. But I watched that show, and I thought to myself, there's almost nothing that is more opposite to our thinking in the 20th century about food than this. The idea, what we're embracing today, that people would be making food from real ingredients on the street and that people would eat them on the street. It's been a complete sea change in how we think about food. Well, at the same time, as we were uh, inventing a new way to think about food and eating, we were also inventing and building a new way to think about cities. And it had a lot of the same characteristics, the world of sort of mass production, very simple, very generic. And you can look at this and say, you know, we had such success winning World War II with a very top-down, very centrally managed, very professionally managed approach and a very industrial approach that we took that mindset and we applied it to all manner of society, including the way that we live in cities. And that was combined with a number of very idealistic utopian schemes for what the new city should be like. And some of these were developed in the late 19th century, but all through the early 20th century, there were a variety of very utopian ideas for what life in city should be. This was the massively popular World's Fair exhibit, Futurama, in 1939 in New York City. And you can see the perfect ribbons of highways with no traffic on them, you know, all brand new towers. And it was this really radical idea that we could wipe the, sl the slate clean and build the perfect city, the utopian place, all at once and never have to have it change. And it wasn't enough for us to build this on the edges of our cities, but we also undertook the destruction and the remaking of cities that were 100 years old or more in the making. And we did this on purpose. We did this because society wanted to do this. We wanted to embrace the new modern way. And this is just one example, but this was the wonderful Main Street of San Bernardino, California, which was turned into this. Um, the entire Main Street tore down for a shopping mall, the mall which, by the way, now is closed. Um, so <laughs> we had this uh, notion that through the right approach of professional planning and professional development and a whole lot of debt, that we could basically eliminate everything that was uh, unsavory or uncomfortable or inconvenient from life in cities. And I think it's important to remember this because when we talk about change today and what might seem like a new idea or a radical idea, we have to keep in mind the truly radical idea was the stuff we did back then. The idea that we should tear everything down, start from scratch, and that we could reorganize all of human life around needing a car to get us from place to place. Those were truly radical ideas. And so we felt uh, we felt the wrath, really, of this change, and our cities really nosedived. This was Soho in New York in the 1970s. Well, the big story today, what we all talk about, is this incredible resurgence of interest of places that we call walkable communities, the interest in the walking and biking culture. And it's become kind of a, a given now that this 
uh, is an interesting trend and that there are more and more people who would like to live this way. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think one thing we're, we're finding is we're reconnecting with the human idea of what it's like to live in a place and use your own human power to get around. And just like there were people who pushed back against the uh, food movement, the industrial food movement of the 20th century, there were also people who stood up and said, wait, I'm not really sure what's going on uh, with our cities, and they pushed back against the prevailing culture. And I've often thought there were really two pretty large groups of people that had a big impact that got us to where we are now. One were all the early historic preservationists, the ones who stood up and said, wait a minute, we're destroying something important here, something that means something to humans and that we like. Let's, let's stop and pay attention. This is one example, Mills Lane, who was a, uh, a wealthy banker uh, in Savannah and through, uh, spent basically his own fortune uh, fixing up buildings and paid for the entire streetscape of the primary uh, street that you would walk on in the middle of Savannah, out of his own pocket. And there are stories, obviously, of people like him in every city around the country. We had our own here in Kansas City as well. People who stood up and, and really, in many ways, saved our civilization from itself. Um, I often think that we should have statues to these people uh, in every city because it's remarkable to think of how many battles they lost, but in the end, they won the war because they turned the tide on people's thinking about what is valuable in cities. Another group were all the millions and millions of middle-class American kids who had the good fortune to be able to travel overseas, often through high school or college-sponsored trips, and got to experience life in another country, often in Europe. Uh, this was me, my first trip when I was 17 years old, right? So it's been a, been a few years. Um, but just a previous generation had gone to Europe to liberate Europe from the Nazis. The later generations got to go to Europe and experience it rebuilt. And for many of us, it was, tr it was tremendously eye-opening that here was a whole different way to live in cities that we did not have available to us in the United States and that we really enjoyed. The fact that you could live in a city and you could walk around and you could take public transportation and have all the great benefits of city life and live a full and complete life doing that. And it really changed a lot of people uh, who decided to come back here and want that change, that type of lifestyle in our own cities here in this country. About 15 or 20 years ago, I was in Albuquerque and I talked with a developer there who was uh, doing uh, some downtown redevelopment work. And his quote to me was, he said, uh, he said, this generation grows up traveling to Europe and they come back wanting to know why America sucks so much. <laughs> so again, there's been this tremendous change in thinking about cities. Some people think this is a generational storyline. Um, I look at it more like this is just the gradual effect of what happened over time. If you were a young person that came out of high school in the 70s or 80s, our cities were pretty abysmal. They weren't enjoyable or desirable places to be for the most part. And it was really the work of all those pioneers for many, many years who changed that tide, who turned the tide and changed the thinking. And nowadays, <clears throat> our cities are so much better, they're so much more enjoyable, that it's a more logical thing that young people would say, we want to be in cities, of course. They're fun, they're interesting again. And it carries over now in surveys to, to every uh, age group. Uh, here's one from the International Council of Shopping Centers which shows a tremendous preference for what we would call a walkable community in basically every age group. So again, this is not the International Council of Urban Planners who want to force you to give up your car. This is the International Council of Shopping Centers. These are pretty hardcore developers, for the most part, who really just try to study where the market is. I like to call this America version 6.0, um, that we're in, we, we're in a new era of thinking about our cities. I did, a, uh, I did a TEDx talk about this that you can find online. I'm not going to repeat all of it, uh, but I did use a lot of slides and pictures to explain the history of city planning America that also make fun of myself, like this one. Um, so I use this one to explain this was version 5.0, uh, which was the previous era, which I called the big party. Version 5.0 was the big party. Everybody gets a house and a car. 
Like, that's it. Everybody gets a house and a car, that's the big party. But what we're going to talk about here a little bit today was that era may have been a bit of a mirage, and was it really all that great anyway? First of all, we had an awful lot of people who were not invited to the party, who couldn't participate in what was going on in those years. And second of all, maybe the results weren't really all so great. And that's what we're really wrestling with today as the outcome of that era. So you can sort of say that the 20th century for our cities was marked by us making generic, very mass-produced and anti-human cities because we felt it was the modern thing to do and we had the money to try some new and pretty dumb things. In this case, this was Frank Lloyd Wright, our, probably our most famous American architect, his vision of life in cities, which he called Broad Acre City. Frank Lloyd Wright, by the way, hated cities. And so his vision looks very much like suburban America as it is today. If you've read his autobiography, you might also say he hated people, which is a, which is, <laughs> it's a whole related matter. But what we're realizing over the last 30 or 40 years is that maybe we were wrong and we've been gradually looking for something else. I want to share one more short video clip. I like to find inspiration a lot of times from people who are not in my field, who I think do a good job of explaining the human condition and what people like. This is a clip um, from uh, uh, one of Anthony Bourdain's shows that uh, I always enjoyed him, and I think he does a great job here talking about Paris and what's enjoyable about Paris. I often wish people in my own field would talk about cities in that manner. I think it's just it's so much more compelling than some of the wonky ways that we, we talk about life in cities. So we've left that era of the utopian mass-produced society where all life is organized around a vehicle to take us places. But the total embrace of that has had consequences that we have to talk about as well. And it's not all a pretty story. That's especially the case for a city like Kansas City a city that I've called Car City USA. Um, in, in many ways, the capital of version 5.0. We wholeheartedly adopted that era's ideas probably more than any city in America. Not just with our more freeway lane miles per capita than any city in the world, but we basically re reorganized all life around freeways and parking. Um, interestingly enough, the one place we didn't do that was the plaza. Right? So even though people wanted to build a freeway next to the plaza, we never built it. And it's fascinating to think that that's the one part of the city that never truly declined like the other parts of the city did. So change is a huge challenge for us in this city and is likely going to be difficult for many, many people and fought by many people. But it's necessary for our economic survival. So let's look at what some of the outcomes were. We truly did hollow out the city on purpose in that era. We had about a 70-year, well-funded effort to destroy a lot of the urban core. This is a graph that shows the population of the urban core, which has stabilized and, and hopefully having a little uptick, which is great, but it's stabilized at a very low level. It's less than half of what we used to have in the urban core. And our incomes, our household incomes, are far less than the regional average in the urban core. That's a double whammy that is really tough to take. So we have, to, we have to consider this and not get complacent about where we are in terms of repopulating the city. It took about 70 years for the city to decline, and we're only about 20 years in to probably a 70 to 100 year effort to rebuild it. And throughout our region, we have strong indicators of economic decline all over the place. The, the, color, the colors on here indicate uh, census tracts that show indicators of economic decline. So that's a very large chunk of our region and might surprise a lot of people. We have an awful lot more of our land area that looks like this than looks really great. And the point of all this is to understand we have a lot of places that are really struggling and we have to be honest about this and face up to it. It's not just one or two places in our city. We have vast areas that are struggling economically. If you don't notice that, it's probably because you've arranged your life in a way to live in the 25% of the built world that's doing just fine. And I don't blame you for that. I mean, I've largely done the same thing. 
but this is, this is something we have to face and discuss. We live in a big, growing, and prosperous region, but take a hard look at what's actually on the ground in a lot of places. If you wonder why we have populist politics on both ends of the political spectrum, it's not hard to figure out why when you go and visit places around just our region. I don't particularly like any, any of those populist politics, but I understand where they come from. And if you get out into places that are unfamiliar, you'll understand. What we've built over the last 70 years, we've, we've also largely built in the suburban fashion, whether it was in the city or in our suburban communities. And the suburban fashion is all about what we, would, we architects would call the private realm. So it's all about making the best sort of indoor space and private back space that you possibly can. And we did this very, very well in our region. We built tremendous private realm uh, all over the place. But when thinking about a shift to a more walkable lifestyle, that's all about the public realm. And that's a big challenge for us. Most of this will not be going away. It will be with us maybe indefinitely. Uh, and much of it will not change. So we have to reconcile that in our region. So the point is, this is a big and difficult transition for us as a city, as a region, for a place that embraced the previous area, era as much as anyone. Our, our culture is going to struggle with change because we have arranged our lives in a way to be dependent on cars and life as we see it today, and most people will think change from that is stupid. And so we have to acknowledge that. We've also built vastly more infrastructure than we'll ever be afforded to maintain, and we have to change our mindsets about what it's like to create places for humans. So the public conversation still largely focuses on manufacturing jobs, bigger roads for cars and highways, and single-family houses for families, even though that era is over. And that's the reality of where we are today at the end of version 5.0. How's everybody doing? Doing all right? So it's going to be OK. I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. Uh, I am a big believer in the ability of people to solve problems, to understand them, to solve them, and to move forward. And I think we'll make the transition fine, but we have to think and act differently. We're going to have to adjust our mindsets. I used to think that this was all just a design problem. I'm an architect, I'm an urban designer, and uh, design is great. It's a great language because it kind of helps you cut through the BS, right? If you have an idea or a theory, you can very easily test it with design. You can try to test solutions, you can, you can test them in the real world with real people, and you find out quickly what's a good idea and what's not. And, and so I used to think we could do that and sort of fix everything. And we can use design to help make our places better, absolutely. But the reality is this is a very complex human problem that we have to wrestle with. So for our next course, um, I'd like to take a step back and remind ourselves again, what is it that people are seeking? What is the goal? What, why is there this tidal wave of change happening and an interest in cities again? Um, when, when I wrote this book, uh, Why I Walk, five years ago, I aimed to try to tell a personal story. Um, I, I really thought of it as me having a conversation with my family and trying to explain things. You know, here's why I do these things that you think are weird. You know, that I live in a place where I walk, that, you know, I, I ride bikes, et cetera. And, and here's what it means to me. And I also wanted, I knew this wasn't just a me story, so I had about a dozen or so co-authors in the book tell their own story, because this is a much bigger, bigger story than that. And so I'm going to talk a little bit from a personal perspective, because I think it's easier to explain that way. And I think it can be helpful to understand what's going on. So, for example, I enjoy... Uh, living in a place where you can have informal social opportunities, where you can just bump into people. And that, frankly, happens much more often in a place where people walk or ride bikes around. I've never been a person who really likes the typical single-family house with a yard. That's just not my thing. Now, ironically, we own one now. Uh, um, but this uh, was more indicative of what my preference was. This was the back of our townhouse in Savannah, and so the townhouse kind of in the front over here, and then they have these uh, courtyards in between, 
and then these garages with an apartment above them in the back. So I like to own. I think owning is great and important. And uh, I just don't really care for having a big yard to do it. It's never been an interest of mine. This was actually a little too big. You know, it was a nice space, but a little larger than I like to maintain. I also really like having income on the property. Um, that helped us pay the mortgage. It helps build wealth. Um, the, the kids today call it house hacking. That's the, the fancy term for it. Something that I actually did twice before here in Kansas City, the idea that you would own a property and you would have income on it. I also really love riding a bike. Now, why do I love riding a bike? It might seem dangerous a lot of places. Well, it's just, frankly, it's just fun. It feels really good. I especially like riding an e-bike or an electric bike. And if you have not ridden an e-bike, that should be at the top of your to-do list this week. Like, go out and do it this week. You can rent them at the bike walk or the Ride KC uh, bike stations. They are so much fun. When I ride someplace on a bike, I arrive, I feel better. It just, I, you know, it, using your body to get around just makes me feel happier and feel better. I also agree with this guy, the, the sort of infamous financial blogger, Mr. Money Mustache, where he said, the bicycle is a wealth-producing fountain of youth. I like it when there are apartments and, uh, and, and more apartments built in a neighborhood and mixed in with where we live. I like the mixture of everything. It's great to have apartments mixed into a, a walkable place because then the people who work in the shops that you may enjoy can afford to actually live there. They can live in the neighborhood as well. And the more people that move into a neighborhood like this, the more opportunity there are for more people. And that's good for me, it's good for all of us when more people have access to opportunity. And when there are more people that live in a neighborhood or move in a neighborhood, that's more customers for the shops that I enjoy and that, frankly, I wish we had more of. We live off 39th Street, and there's a lot of great little local businesses there. I wish we had twice as many as we have there, because it's fantastic to be able to walk out your door and enjoy a wide range of businesses. We often talk in neighborhoods that, gosh, it would be great if we had a grocery store, if we had a drugstore, et cetera, et cetera, but those stores don't just magically appear. There have to be enough people there with enough income to spend to make those succeed. And I enjoy the variety and diversity of human life and all that a city provides. I'm a city person. So these things are enjoyable to me, even if they look a little rough around the edges. More people in a neighborhood makes a neighborhood safer. More people walking around 24-7 provides more opportunity to have a safe place without a police presence. Because the last thing that criminals want to see or somebody looking to do something bad is to see people. They look for places that are devoid of human activity. So the more people walking around, the safer a neighborhood is. The more people that live in a place, the more money there is available for the services that I need and that I enjoy. So whether that's fire or police or parks or fixing potholes, that money has to come from somewhere. And if we have more people and more businesses in our neighborhood, that's more money that is available without raising taxes. I'm concerned about climate change. You know, we have two kids. I'm, I'm concerned about what kind of world we might be leaving to them and what their life is going to be like. And it's really hard to figure out tangible things that you can do for climate change, but absolutely the number one most tangible thing you can do is live in a place where you don't need to drive and encourage more people to do the same, welcome more people into that world, since the number one source of carbon emissions is through cars. I also enjoy a space that is car-free or without cars at all. It has all the benefits and joys of city life without any of the obnoxiousness of having vehicles around. It's also really good for my kids. They can run free and be very independent in an environment like this. This helps them build confidence. That's a good thing for children. So that's some of the, the human side and some of the, the good and the fun side that I think we should be excited about. These are the things that are connecting people. Now, I know many of those images don't look like Kansas City. They don't look like pla in places in much of America. But I think it's important to understand that's the aspiration. That's what a lot of people are really hoping for. And more and more people every year are saying, why can't we have places like that uh, in our city? So the point is, we have to acknowledge what's going on and be ready to take action. So the really great thing is, we are taking action, and good things are happening in Kansas City. Um, a lot of experimenting is going on. 
and there's been a sea change in interest in living in the city in the last 20 years. It's pretty remarkable to think that we have um, effectively apartment towers in downtown Kansas City today. Who could have thought that 25 years ago? I wouldn't have. I would hope for it. I certain, certainly didn't think it would happen. So we've done enough to prove the demand, the interest in, in city living, which is incredible. That puts us ahead of some cities and behind others. And in, in a certain sense, we're building what looks like a 21st century downtown in Kansas City, which is a much more residential, much more mixed type of neighborhood than anything that any of us are familiar with. But we also have to challenge ourselves to take the next steps and take the next steps forward. Again, I would say the goal should be we want broad enough change that it lifts up the lives of as many people as possible and not just a few. And to do this, we often need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we part of the solution or are we part of the problem? So I'm going to suggest a few things um, that we should think about, some questions we should ask ourselves. And some of these you might find to be outlandish or crazy, maybe even offensive. Um, but these are the sort of things that we need to be thinking about if we're looking forward to the next 20 or 30 years and to truly take advantage and be proactive for the change that is going on today. So change is here and it is going to accelerate. And we need to shift our mindsets from being fearful of change and restrictive to being hopeful and proactive. That's an important point I hope to leave with you. We need to shift to being hopeful and proactive. Let's accelerate the positive change and remember that most of it really is positive. And it's best for us to try to embrace change rather than try to resist it because fear and resistance, while understandable, only makes the change worse for everybody. And we're still in the, in the early years. So as, as Crosby mentioned earlier, um, we're, we talk a lot about small scale and incremental change in our cities. And this is a key idea and it's a tough idea for a lot of us to wrap our heads around. But one thing I think we need to ask ourselves or tell ourselves is that we need to let our neighborhoods grow and change again. This humble duplex, we have effectively zoned out of existence in our city. It's functionally impossible to build a duplex in most neighborhoods, even though we have hundreds, if not thousands of them around the city. Now, I know why that is, and I understand what happened. I understand what happened in the bad years, but we have to understand we're in a different era, and it's an opportunity for us to think differently. We have neighborhoods all over the urban core that are shifting from being low demand places to high demand places. And that's a real challenge to our thinking. Now, 20 years ago, um, I wrote a column for the Star uh, in, under their Midwest Voices banner, and the first column I wrote was, does Kansas City really want to be a city? And I, and I asked that sincerely, because I want to know. Because it, being a city actually means a lot of trade-offs, right? Being a really successful city, you can't have a very successful city and also be a place where it's easy to drive and park everywhere. That does not exist and cannot physically exist. So there are trade-offs. And I think the answer to that over the last 20 years has been sort of a qualified yes, that there's a lot of interest and demand, but we're still hanging on to a lot of ideas from the previous era about what life in cities should be like. And I think the question I would ask us today is, are we smart enough to learn from the mistakes of other cities? And can we set aside what we wish to be true and learn what actually works, what actually makes the most positive change? And the reason I ask that again is because thinking of a mindset of welcoming change and being proactive as opposed to being fearful. Because when we're fearful and we try to stop things or slow them down, the experience of every other city in the country that is a couple of steps of ahead of us is that all of your worst fears do come true, that prices really do explode and people really do get priced out, that traffic and parking really do get worse because you're only making limited change in a few places. 
So that's why we need to make a lot of that small change. Now, we used to be able to change a lot in a, in a very short period of time. When Klaus Klinkenberg left the Netherlands with his wife, Klausina, so yes, say that three times in a row, Klaus and Klausina Klinkenberg. Um, when they left the Netherlands in 1871 um, with their eight kids in tow um, and ended up in Leavenworth County, there really wasn't, there weren't a whole lot of people uh, in this area or this region. Kansas City, Missouri only had about 55,000 people in 1880. But within a span of 50 years, Kansas City, Missouri was 400,000 people. That's pretty remarkable to think about. I like to think about this as, and call this the city building era because not only did we accommodate this enormous population influx, if you think about it, we also basically built all of the neighborhoods and the buildings that we most admire and most love in that era. And we did all of that without a zoning ordinance, without a parking requirement, without a planning commission, and without neighborhood input on development. So I'm not advocating to get rid of all those things, but I think it's important to understand that that happened in that era, and we we're able to accomplish some pretty remarkable things. The neighborhoods that we produced in that era were, are these wonderfully mixed up, diverse, and mixed use neighborhoods all over Midtown and the Old Northeast area. So I think an interesting question for us to ask as we think about the future is, should these neighborhoods be closer to what our ideal neighborhood is like? The wonderfully diverse, with, there's a housing type for everybody, and they're largely walkable and bike friendly and great for public transportation. And should we shed the notion that the ideal neighborhood is a neighborhood of only single family homes, which really only caters to a pretty small portion of the population? We also need to start um, reversing some of the bad ideas a little more quickly from the previous era. So this is, um, th this is a, a story that could probably happen a thousand times over across our city, but this is a bus stop on 39th Street that uh, I often stand at with my almost four-year-old daughter. Um, she really loves taking the bus. She thinks it's really fun. Um, she likes to take the bus to her preschool and so we'll do that every once in a while, and, uh, and we enjoy it. But you'll notice at the top, there's a little sign that says no parking from 7 to 9 a.m., which is obviously during what we consider rush hour. Well, again, this is an idea that was left over from the previous era, where the idea was that all of city life should be organized around flushing as much traffic into the city in the morning and out in the evening. And really, we often talk about our streets as car sewers in this regard. That we should clear out all the width of the street so people can drive really quickly in and out of the city. But it has consequences, right? We understand why that is, but it has consequences. One consequence is when you're standing there by the curb or sitting there, it feels terribly dangerous. And you just know that you are one text message or one Facebook notification away from somebody jumping the curb, and you're dead at the speeds that people are driving. And those things actually do happen. There are people who are killed this way. And so we need to ask, what is the value of human life? What is the value of encouraging traffic to go quickly on our streets for a limited portion of the day, as opposed to another method? These changes that we made in this era were all made by fallible human beings just like all of us. These were not handed to us on a tablet from Moses, right? These were made by people like us. So the good thing is that change is really easy and popular. So um, I, I know this is all going to be a snap. But I think we have the opportunity today to look at our city with fresh eyes. We don't have to see it the way we have always seen it you know, those of us who've lived here all of our lives. This is a new era, and it should be exciting. And so I aspire to create a vision where we enable and embrace the complex and ever-changing nature of life in cities, because that's how human beings are, right? We are never simple. We're born, we grow, we grow old, we die. We're never perfect. We're always changing. In fact, most therapists would tell you to embrace the change, right, that this is part of life. You grow and you change. 
And our cities really are nothing more than collections of human beings. And it's best for us to try to embrace that and accept the messiness of life. So this is the messiness of life. Um, but there are benefits to an approach that is more welcoming, more permissive of change. It makes life more interesting, it embraces more human diversity, it enables more innovation, and it provides more opportunity for more people than a more restrictive approach. And I want to emphasize that the changes happening today, they're not changes because of greedy developers or because of corrupt government uh, planners or officials. The changes are happening because people are increasingly wanting something different. This is where a lot of this is coming from. It's not a conspiracy. So let's be aspirational. I want us to be aspirational, to be hopeful, to be excited. I think we should be like Casey Kasem, right? Who remembers Casey Kasem? Come on. <laughs> of course. I used to listen to him all the time. How about let's be like Daniel Burnham? So I think you probably all know this quote. Daniel Burnham also wrote this. This was page two of the plan of Chicago where he basically said, okay, yes, let's do great plans, but let's also be practical and do things step by step. And so we need to do things step by step and incrementally. We need, to, we need a whole lot of small change in our neighborhoods in our city in order to be prepared for what's coming next. We need a lot of small change in our cities, in our streets, and it's great to embrace this and be entrepreneurial about it and to sort of find yourself and a few friends and just make these changes. Don't wait for City Hall to try to do these things. Take it upon yourself and try to make this change yourself. And by the way, I think that that's something that Kansas Cityans are really good at. I think Kansas Cityans are really good at embracing things and being entrepreneurial about it. So we need to hit a lot of singles and doubles. Um, because that's how, uh, that's how we initiate change. But every once in a while, we have to hit some home runs too, and I don't want us to forget that. Sometimes to win the World Series, you've gotta hit a home run in game one in the bottom of the ninth, right? And we need to hit a few home runs too. We have a lot to undo from the previous era. We just have to recognize we don't have as much money flowing as we did in the 1950s and 60s. We can't do it all. We're going to have to be very strategic and thoughtful with any big initiatives. So here's a few other ideas. Again, when you look at your city differently, when you see it differently, you begin to see opportunities that you may not have thought about before. And one of the things that I like to think a lot about is public space, because we don't really have very much good public space in Kansas City or most American cities. But think about this. This is the intersection of Westport Road and Broadway, which is mostly just uh, a place for traffic today. When you step back and look at it, it's actually the size and shape of a pretty great urban square. So what if it were something like Sundance Square in Fort Worth, which was also a great new public space carved out of a pretty busy traffic area? On the flip side, the infamous triangle at Southwest Traffic Way and Westport Road, which is a god-awful tangled mess of ugliness and traffic today. But why does it have to be that way? It doesn't have to be that way. Why can't it also be something civic, something public, something like Campus Martius Park in Detroit? which was a new park carved out of a very big and difficult intersection as well um, that also has done wonderful things. At a small level, there are a thousand small changes we could make like this as well across our city. I chose one example here on the plaza, this uh, parking lot behind Classic Cup and Starbucks, which is home for just a few cars today. Um, what if we had a plaza on the plaza, right? So if we're gonna do Seville, why not really do Seville? You know, this is, this is about the same size. And what if we thought more about our city in, in a bigger way and said, let's designate a part of the city that is a low speed priority zone. Cars are welcome. You can have a car, you can drive into this place, it's just fine. We're not, we're not saying nobody can have cars, but your speed is not the priority. So you will be physically forced to go slower if you drive through this part of the city. And we're gonna have great walking, great biking, great public transportation, but most of all, really great spaces for human beings. How many people would be interested in a place like that, living in a place like that? It's a lot. So what I've shown up here is a big area. That's a large area. That's 26 square miles. That's most of our urban core. But in the context of our city, it's really quite small. It's less than 10% of the land of just in Kansas City, Missouri, 
and less than 1% of the land in our entire region. Can we take less than 1% of the land in our region and do something really special for human beings with it? I really like what Tennessee Williams said here. <clears throat> so, I think he's right, too, in many respects. I think another aspect is we need to demand excellence and hold each other accountable. Now, we're all nice people, Midwest, you know, I'm a Midwesterner, um, I love Midwesterners, we're all nice by nature, but we're often way too accommodating of mediocrity, and we've been so for too many years in regards to our city. And mediocrity accumulates over time, and not in a good way. So we need to demand excellence from each other and hold each other accountable, or we'll never make Tennessee Williams' list. I think we can make it, why can't we? So let's not look to our peer cities, for examples. To be honest, most of our peer cities are pretty mediocre too. There's nothing terribly special about them. Why don't we look to the best places for inspiration, the best examples of humans living in cities? Why don't we do what Michael Stern suggested? Good enough is not good enough. What an impact he's had on the symphony. Why don't we be like Robbie Mackinnon? Why can't we be the best practice? who's transforming the ATA in such a profound way. So in order to wrap up here, um, I just, I, I like to remind, this is as much to remind myself of these things as anything, but what we have is not really a technical problem. We often like to think that this is a technical problem, it's about engineers and it's about architects and um, you know, manuals and everything else. What we really have is a complex human problem. And in order to solve a complex human problem, we actually all have to talk to each other again. We have to tell our stories. If any of this resonates with you, then I encourage you to tell your story too and talk to your friends and neighbors and have conversations where you can be realistic with people and say, this is what I enjoy. This is a lifestyle that I'm looking for. Each of us can be the solution because no problem is ever solved by trying to force somebody else to do it for us. Problems are always solved by saying, I'm the person who can solve that, and I know other people who can help me. I'd like for us to find a way to build empathy with other people who may not see the world the way we do, and, and in return, ask for understanding and empathy from them. So, I don't need everybody to want urban living. I'm always gonna be an evangelist for it because I love it, I'm excited about it, I like it so much. But I don't need people to convert. I don't need my family members to convert or my friends. But I do need people to understand what it is that people like about urban living so that when they come to visit, to spend money, to hang out, that they do so respectfully and they slow down and they pay attention to the fact there are people walking and riding bikes and they do that because they love that, and that's the lifestyle they want to live. Another way to put it that I've said before is this. So this may be kind of crass, this might be too crass for you, but it's, it's sort of how I feel about cities and towns. So find your own way to talk about it as well. And let's move from a focus and obsession about transportation, about getting from place to place, to an obsession about making great places, about place making because great places stand the test of time and they accommodate every mode of transportation that we can invent. So live slow, accept walk-ins, <laughs> talk with your friends and family members about great spaces. How enjoyable is it to hang out in a beautiful public square? How great it is to be in a place like this and have a meal and people watch. How good it feels to go walking afterwards how great it feels to ride a bike in a place where bikes are welcomed and part of the norm. This culture change that is happening is real and it will endure. And there's a financial side of it that is incredibly important that we'll talk about as well. I like to say that plenty of people still love McDonald's, right? I still like McDonald's occasionally. It's not going away, um, but increasingly, we find we want something more from food, that that fast food doesn't satisfy us. And it's very much the same about cities. Much of our 
suburban American lifestyle that we built is not going away. You know, the vast majority of it is not going to change. But increasingly, people are wanting something else from cities, and they realize they want a place that appeals to, their, to our own humanity. And we can, we can make these changes, and we can accept and do these things because it helps everyone. Broader acceptance of change and being welcoming of change provides more opportunity. Good public space is good for everyone. Slowing traffic down is safer for everyone. Our biggest threat, our biggest, the thing that might hold us back the most is complacency with a dash of arrogance mixed in with our fear of change. While we might wring our hands, <coughs> other people will act and will continue to make change in their places. <coughs> we have many, many very smart people in our suburban jurisdictions across this metro, and they also know these changes are going on, and they're going about the business of building their own little downtowns and urban places. And that's great. I applaud them. That's a wonderful thing for our city. But we have to understand that that will siphon market share away from the growth that we desperately need in our urban core so that we can get our population back to where it once was. So my hope is that we can, as a people, begin to understand what's going on, that we have a deep understanding of the changes being made, that we accept and embrace that change, that we look for all sorts of small and even big opportunities to make change and demand excellence with each other, and that we seek and build empathy with people who don't necessarily see the world the same way we do, or in my case, the same way I do. And if we do those things, I think we can make a great city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. We've got two microphones here in front. If you have a question, uh, please come up to the microphone. Sir. I have lived downtown on Quality Hill since 2010. And in theory, we have everything that we need to make what you're talking about take place. We are um, near every kind of transportation that you can possibly imagine. And also shopping is convenient and there's lots of activities that are present. But in terms of transportation, one of the problems that we have is that whether the people are walking, riding bikes, riding scooters, driving, or anything else you could think of, no one thinks that there is any reason why they should have to obey any traffic laws at all. So we have people routinely going 15, 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. Mm -hmm. We have people who are pedestrians routinely crossing streets without looking to see whether there's anything coming. We have scooters riding on the sidewalk without helmets. And we have bicyclists who are doing the same thing. And in general, there is just no institutional support to encourage people to try to live within a certain parameter of cooperation when they're moving from one place to another. So my question for you is, what kind of institutional change do you see that is a possibility so that people could be educated that they would be much better off if they all stopped doing all those illegal acts? Well, I may not, I may not give you a very satisfying answer on that. Um, I, I think what we have going on today, there, it's, it's complex. There's a lot of reasons for all that. There's a certain aspect of new things come around, like scooters, new technology, new, new uh, electric bikes, and immediately people uh, behave um, very randomly and chaotically. And eventually I think that settles down because there are some norms that get established and people, people figure out a way. I've already noticed that the people who ride scooters, it's, it's different than it was even a year ago, and many more now are riding in the streets instead of the sidewalks. But I think the unsatisfying part of the answer is that uh, what I see coming towards us is probably more chaos and more complexity on the streets. And if you look back 100 years, um, that was kind of how life was in cities. 
if you look at old pictures of how our cities were before the car was dominant, um, you find all manner of activity happening in the middle of the street. If you go to other parts of the world, spend some time overseas, you'll increasingly find that that's what it's like in cities all over the world, that it, from the standpoint of standing there on the curb, it looks really confusing and chaotic. The beauty of that is if everybody is moving at a slow speed, it's safe. Where that becomes a problem is if one of those elements is moving really fast. So like if a car is driving really fast through there, uh, that can be unsafe. But if everybody is moving uh, at a speed under 20 miles an hour, you can really accommodate a lot of different uses on the street very safely. So that may not be a satisfying solution or resolution to it, but I, I, I feel we'll probably have more chaos coming, not, not less. I want to go over here. Yes, sir. Um, I had a political science professor that said something that might sound crazy on, on, on its surface, but he said that there should be an alliance between urban America and agricultural America. And he says, I looked at him like a, he said, you think I'm crazy, don't you? I said, well, I don't know, that's going to, I don't know. He said, because ur suburban sprawl uh, hollows out cities, but they also pave over farmland. And I went to the fair, this state fair in Sedalia, and that's Ag Central, uh, it might be. And I threw that idea at some of these guys at the Farm Bureau headquarters. And they said, well, if, if the urban farmer will get on our team and get on the, become part of the farm block and, and work with us, be the best thing ever happened. And so my question is, do you think there's a possibility of an alliance between urban America and agricultural America in view of what the, my old professor said. Is there, is there any, any possibility in that? And that's a political question. You're not a politician. Yeah, I know. But is, is Always that risky. possible? Uh, I, yeah. hope, I certainly hope so, because we need each other. You know, uh, urban America needs rural America, um, and because they provide most of the, the food that we eat. Uh, and, uh, you know, I grew up in, in the rural parts of the Midwest for the most part. And uh, so I have a special affection for it. And also, I worry a great deal about it because most of rural America has been declining for 120 years, and it's not a pretty situation. Um, but we certainly need each other. The cities need the rural areas, and the rural areas need the cities because that's where a lot of the people and the money and the customers are. So uh, I, I would hope that you're right about that. Yes? Uh, this question from my wife was putting kids to sleep. You're going to blame her? Yeah. So uh, can you elaborate more about gentrification and more inclusive uh, development for Kansas City? So, uh, you know, talking about gentrification is always difficult because it's not like there's a commonly held definition for what that means. And I often find that if you ask 10 different people what gentrification is, you're going to get 10 different answers. Some people who think it's the greatest thing ever and some people who think it's the worst thing ever. Um, so it, it's difficult. Um, I think the, the, the biggest fear, obviously, is the fear of people being displaced from neighborhoods they've lived in you know, all their lives or even for a couple generations. And that's a very understandable fear. Um, what, what has actually been observed in most cities is that is incredibly rare. And what is more common are neighborhoods that are struggling in that continue to decline. And we have far more neighborhoods that have concentrations of poverty that are a real troublesome issue than places that are successful where some people get priced out of. Now, I'm not saying that getting priced out of a place is a good thing, um, but one of the reasons that I think we need to think and, and ask questions about, of ourselves about change and about growth in cities is because the, the only tangible, long-lasting solution that I've seen that helps take the pressure off is embracing the change and welcoming people in because that provides more opportunity for more people to live in a neighborhood and generally reduces the amount of people who get priced out or feel like they want to leave. And so it's a very difficult and complex issue and uh, there are no simple answers that I or anybody else can give, but that's, that's one thought process I have for us all to, to look at. 
Hi, so I, the slow speed area idea I think is really neat, but I, my question is as affordable housing grows farther and farther away from urbanized, centralized cities as housing costs rise and stuff like that, would that cause an inaccessibility of lower income areas who have been pushed out to the outer skirts of the city? I, think, I, I think that could be a problem if you define an area like that too small. So that's one reason I chose and, and drew a, a pretty big area. 26 square miles is a very large area. It can really encompass and hold, you know, I think all of the, ma the demand we would ever need for, for that type of lifestyle. Um, so I think if we think too small, that could, that could be a problem. That, you know, and I think one of, the, one of the things that I used to talk about in, in other presentations, um, the thing that most people don't think about as much today is the, the real troublesome social issue of the next 20 or 30 years is, is suburban poverty. Um, and uh, that's because, you know, with urban poverty is bad enough, but at least in urban places, you generally have some access to public transportation. And in most suburban areas, it's incredibly difficult to, find, to provide transportation uh, for people who don't have very much money. And so one of the things we have to really be concerned about and try to be proactive about is to not just say we're gonna, we're gonna push all the poor people to places where they need a car to live on the edge of the city in housing that probably wasn't built to last. So that, that's a real long-term issue for us to, to be concerned with. Yes, how, how do we develop growth other than voting, you know, and poor neighborhoods versus good neighborhoods because a lot of times when we go shopping, we can't get our money back or exchange. So how do we develop growth other than complaining about the situation? Because a lot of times we get the doors shut on us mm -hmm. and we look to vote and we don't still get what we want. Mm -hmm. So how do we develop growth for our city, not just for Kansas City? Mm -hmm. I'm from Kansas, so I came over here. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do? So, I mean, it's a, it's a great... development over here is much better, and I'm driving from Taganasi all the way over here just to get entertainment, because our city is liking that. Right. Um, it's a great question, uh, and I think the, the best thing that I can offer to that is there are, there are other people in this series who really are much more eloquent than I am about what it means. And I often think the best place for us to start is to start by saying, what can I do? What can I and my friends do? How can we do things together? Uh, a number of us are affiliated with a group called the Incremental Development Alliance. And the mission of that organization is to try to teach people how to do small development projects so that you can take charge of life in your own neighborhood. And so there are courses that, that we do that educate people about the fundamentals of development, what you have to learn and what the financials are, so that it empowers people to say, I want to be the one who provides the change in, in my neighborhood or my city. I think that's the best approach. It's the most realistic approach. One of the founders of the group says very realistically to us that nobody is coming to save your neighborhood. Right? Nobody is coming. So we have to be the ones to save our neighborhoods. And we have to figure out how to do the things that, and provide the things that we want. Right. Right. Thank you. Kevin, let's do these last five questioners here. Okay. Hey, uh, Kevin, Troy Schulte announced today he was going to be resigning, retiring mm -hmm. as city manager for Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, said he wanted to let the new mayor and council kind of have their own, their own man. Um, what one piece of, uh, what one thing would you want council and the mayor to be looking for interrogating the next city manager for? Mm, wow, that's, a, that's a, like a reporter's question, isn't it? <laughs> like you're an old reporter or something, or journalist. I also retired, yes. <laughs> um, one thing. 
to look for in a new city manager, you know. So I've spent most of my life, pretty much all my life, working in cities where it's a council manager form of government. And what most people don't realize is the most important person is the city manager, not the mayor. Um, because the city manager is the one who really initiates and, and kind of leads the, the city bureaucracy. Um, that's a really, it's really hard for me to pick out one quality or, or one aspect. I think for me, what I would hope is the new city manager embraces an attitude that we're not done. You know, we're not done rebuilding this city. In fact, we have many, many years to go and we still need to, um, we still need to embrace and welcome change, development, and growth in our city. Now, that could mean a hundred different things. You know, the devil's always in the details on that. Um, but I, I, I want us to, to continue to move forward as a city because I think we've just really gotten started. I'm interested in your slide. You had uh, kind of a heat map of economic pockets that were declining. Yeah. What, can you tell us the source on that? Yeah, that was um, actually a consultant report for the city of Kansas City that, that they did, uh, I think, earlier last year. Um, and it was, um, I forget the name of the firm, but basically it was a market research firm that looked at the economics of the market of the whole Kansas City region. So, so and, they, and it, was, it was basically a lot of census data and mixed in with other data. And you look at the human side of the equation, so what is causing those economic downturns in those pockets? And then from your standpoint, how do we reverse them? Well, um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think there are different reasons for decline in, in different pockets. There are different census tracts. Um, a, a lot of it is, obviously, there are a lot of census tracts on, on the east side in, in our city that have been declining for in, you know, a long time. That's nothing particularly new, but still exhibiting signs of decline. There are a lot of places in our suburbs that have aged out of their first or second generation of development and just aren't desirable anymore for the suburban customer or the suburban resident. And, and so those have declined in desirability. And as a result, you know, the house prices and the economic fortunes are declining as well. And some of it's probably about access to jobs and employment, you know, or convenient employment too. Over here. It's interesting that your the division that you point out in your presentation between the, the, the personal and socialization of, of, of a project solution and uh, mechanics. You seem to be more on that side than the mechanical side. You could downplay the mechanical side, the, um, the, the machinery side of it, rather than a preference for the, for the, uh, the, the social advocacy part, which is uh, idealistic, yeah. I think, and, and, and desirable. Um, in different cities, th that that sort of social um, social socialized uh, force can have a bigger part of the city's planning, and which results in the differences between theirs and ours. Right now, um, it seems to me, from my standpoint, the only th way to do it right now is is mechanical side. You know, you have to provide transportation, which we don't have. Uh, we've got a little model. Uh, model railroad from from Union Station down to River Key, uh, which is real nice to to travel down there. Electricity and it's free, and and you can get there without having to drive your car, which is real nice. Um, it seems to me like like that's only a springboard on what we need to do. We need to to to, to extend that free traffic uh, electric system from downtown Kansas City to the airport for one, and then go from Kansas City to Denver and St. Louis for two, and keep on going. It seems to me that that's the crux of, of our solutions, what is going to happen. Um, if not, how are those socialized side going to have an effect and how can we make that have a more powerful effect mm -hmm. uh, like your innovative you know, creation uh, group? Maybe yeah. that should be multiplied uh, over and over again. We can go to the school system and say, hey, this is a necessity. We need to have these sorts of classes being taught in public school right now. So the next generation will know automatically they don't have to go to another little side pocket committee in order to do it. They know it through their studies that they've already been through right. in order to graduate. Yeah, you know, in fact, they used to teach the plan of Chicago in the Chicago public schools for, for a few generations. That was, that was And we don't do anything curriculum. near that. Yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't talk about the mechanical and technical side much today because, you know, that's kind of what I do 
every day. And I, I, I do that in my day job, and uh, I've done that for 25 years, and it, it is incredibly important, and you're right. I focus a lot on the human side because I feel like uh, what I've really come to learn is, in, in a certain sense, getting the technical side of things right is, is fairly easy. And we can learn how to do things, we can build things, we can operate things. Um, that's kind of easy. The hard part is getting people to support wanting them to happen in the first place. Uh, the hard part is getting people to embrace the idea of maybe changing a street to make it a slower street on purpose, or to carve out a public space uh, where there isn't one today. And so those things are all doable, but we, we have to have a broad enough support for them or we can never implement uh, the other side of it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for this wonderful talk. Uh, two questions. One has to do with immigrants. We learned that immigrants revitalize small town Kansas. Uh, we see lovely immigrant uh, businesses here in town. How do you bring that to bear here on a larger scale without putting them into ghettos? And the second question had to do with the idea of, of what you say is this encouraging micro developments versus big city planning. Uh, you know, how do you bring these two together? To make well, I mean, we have, to, we have a great active immigrant population here in the city. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's bizarre for anybody who would think that that is not a good thing. It's obviously a great thing. The immigrants really add uh, to our country, add a tremendous amount of activity and positive activity to, to a city. And they rejuvenate areas that uh, often were, um, were struggling and, and failing. And so, and you can see examples of that all over our city, which is, is a wonderful thing. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's terrific. Uh, I'd love to see more of it. I'd love to see more people coming into our city who embrace urban life no matter where they're from. Um, so the second question is how do you sort of then reconcile the small scale uh, development and, and really implement that or? or Vis-a-vis -vis the big planning, okay. So the way, um, my best analogy for this, since I just spent nine years living in Savannah, Georgia, which is uh, arguably the most famous planned city in America. It has this wonderful uh, plan that was done in 1733 by General Oglethorpe um, that was an incredibly idealistic city plan. Um, and it was built out over generations of time. So there is this fantastic one square mile national uh, register uh, historic district uh, that actually, interestingly enough, fits perfectly within a one square mile grid. Um, but that, that plan uh, was, was one of the hallmarks of what, what does an ideal city plan look like? It's one, one vision of it. It has 22 public squares uh, within that one square mile and half of a 30 acre uh, sort of central park type space. It's a remarkable plan. What you can learn from that about Savannah was that it was a combination of a really bold and daring vision, but it was all implemented very gradually by thousands of different people over a period of about 200 years, right? So they set in place a formula, which in Savannah was a 60 foot by 90 foot lot um, that people could buy. And then those were developed incrementally by lots and lots and lots of different builders and people and homeowners. And so I think there's absolutely a way to combine a, a bold vision for renewal for a place uh, and figuring out then how do you empower as many people as possible to be the ones who implement that. And part of our job with that today is we also have to train people now how to do it because we've lost a lot of that category of small developer over the years as we've only come to build really big developments or single family houses. And so there used to be a whole group of people who were small investors or owners that would build duplexes and fourplexes and sixplexes. So we've kind of lost them and we've made it incredibly hard to do, you know, really uh, as sort of uh, a thousand good intentions gone bad. And so we have to rethink that in order to enable that implementation to happen and really not look for a single big developer solution to be the solution. Um, I have two uh, questions uh, that are really about the same thing that seem to fly in the face of what you say about public space. Sure. Uh, that the public, 
did not want to happen, and people ignored that. And I went and I'm curious about why. Um, up until two years ago, I was one of those people who offered uh, under market level apartments in Westport area on purpose because I believe very strongly in people being able to live where they work and there's housing for that you mentioned. Um, I love your idea of the public spaces you've r charted out. That sounds wonderful. Um, I uh, recently we had that building go up in Westport on the corner, the six mm -hmm. story building where um, nobody in the air in the neighborhood was against a three story building, which was in the plans um, some time. And the people, uh, the developer listened not to us. Um, and so I don't know, and, and that building makes <laughs> it less open looking. So I'm interested in why that, those things happen. The other one that I think about is about three years ago, up until three years ago, that fountain at Crown Center, the one that spouts up, it gathered children of all colors there playing. It was delightful to see. And somehow that was shut off. So sometimes it seems like the public is ready for some of those things and the people in charge aren't. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the Westport people would have supported the tearing down of that bank, but not so tall and high. Mm -hmm. And how is it that we can, and there was a lot of input, so how is it that we can try to get some of the people in charge to see the idea of what the public yeah. wants? Yes. So, we went to the meetings. Tough questions. And I haven't been here. I haven't been back here for long, so I don't know them as intimately as you. Public space is a challenge. And um, there is always a tug of war uh, between the provision and need for good public space and then how to manage it, uh, how, to, how to operate it so that it, it, um, it benefits uh, all of the people who want to use it. So I'm, I have, did not realize the fountain was gone from Crown Center Square. I'm sorry to hear that. It's still there? It's shut off. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that makes it easier understanding. And it is private space. So Crown Center Redevelopment has the opportunity to manage that however they want to. Right. Well, it was a health thing. Okay. So I'm wading into waters. I don't really know the facts, um, which is dangerous. Um, so, but I, you know, I have certainly witnessed the fact over many years that there's always a tug of war in public space. And we do have to realize that uh, it's, um, it's really important to provide it, but it does have to be managed by somebody too. Um, so that it, and it has to be managed so that it's a pleasant and inviting place for all kinds of people to enjoy. Uh, in regards to the Westport situation, I, again, I don't know it as intimately. I see the results of what's being built. It's certainly, that's not what we would call incremental development or incremental change. Uh, I may also disagree. I don't really, I don't find it as offensive on that particular corner or street simply because Broadway is such a wide street and what we would say as urban designers is there's a relationship between how big the space is between the buildings and how big the buildings are um, that actually goes back to, to the Renaissance and how people measured these things. And the closer they are to one-to-one, -one, the more comfortable that space feels as a, as a human being walking around. So if you have a really wide street, that tends to welcome taller buildings. As, whereas if you have a really narrow street, it tends to work better for shorter buildings because that's what makes the outdoor room kind of feel right. Um, the slide of Sundance Square, for example, that I showed, those were pretty big buildings around it in downtown Fort Worth. So there's a, there's a pro and a con to each of those, and I understand the objections, and I might like to see a more incremental approach with 
a number of different buildings and, and owners personally, but I don't object to that one maybe as much as, as you might. So that's just sort of an off-the-cuff response. So, Kevin, thank, thank you, you very so much. much.